but I think that pride can lead to burnout because if you're always the answer man, if you're always the pe- the person people go to when they have questions, then there's that pressure on you. Whereas if you're putting yourself in the place of the learner, you have to assume a different posture and it kind of just even relaxes you. Welcome to the Feast Over Famine podcast. On this podcast, we're navigating the tension that we find where mission and profit collide. We're talking to CEOs, founders, executive directors, impact investors, and all of what we've identified as the global ecosystem of the social enterprise, business for transformation, business as mission landscape. We're talking to them about the obstacles they face, the strategic challenges they've been through, how they're funded, how they were started, and everything that's happened in between. We are trying to share their story in a way that's impactful to help us all to grow the social enterprise space for the better. Enjoy this week's episode with your host, Ryan Mahaffey. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another week of the Feast Over Famine podcast. Uh, This is your host, Ryan Mahaffey. Stoked you guys are here and really excited for this week's episode. Um, Erica is back with us after uh, a season of us not doing these internal episodes as much and Erica having a baby and all that stuff. So Erica, welcome back. I'm stoked to be. I am too, Ryan. It feels like it's been a long time. It has been a long time. I, I, maybe it was even like the spring since we did this, but um, we've had some cool projects and uh, impact investors and all sorts of stuff on since then. But um, these have always turned out to be some of our most popular episodes. So even though I think no one wants to hear us talk about it, they want to hear other people talk about it. Um, maybe we're wrong and people do want to hear it. So uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll yeah. see how it goes. Hopefully with people ones. can learn from some of the do's and don'ts that we've done living in this social enterprise world ourselves. So hopefully this is a helpful internal podcast for everybody. Totally, totally. Yeah. And so that that's a good transition to what we're tackling, which is really uh, 15 ways to kind of recognize, manage, avoid, and recover from, um, we'll say that differently, recover from burnout, uh, particularly as it relates to um, the social enterprise ministry world. Um, Erica, like what, what are your thoughts on why this is so relevant in the social enterprise kind of ministry space? I I know you've been in that world a lot, been to seminary, you've run an NGO internationally, uh, all sorts of stuff. And you've seen a lot of it, um, share, share a little bit of like why you think this is important particular, I mean, it's important all, all around, but particularly. Well, I think anybody who's serving in the social enterprise ministry, nonprofit world, even like this time of year, their head might be spinning as they get ready for year end fundraising or advent campaigns or different things like that. And so I think that for a lot of people that are in the world that we're in, it's not a normal nine to five job. And so you aren't guaranteed your 10 minute break or your lunch hour every day. And so I think that because a lot of this is people going out on their own to start things, then you have to run hard and you have to go hard for a season. And sometimes if you don't set out the right way, you can find yourself in a season of burnout without even realizing it until it's too late. And so I think just because people are, not in that kind of cookie cutter nine to five job. It happens a lot more often. Well, I think too, you know, the, um, a lot of people get involved in social enterprise or ministry or nonprofit, like early in their career, not always, but sometimes they do. And so the first time you're burnt out, we're going to talk about how to recognize it and all that kind of stuff. But like the first time that happens, it's the first time it happened, you know? So if someone's later in their career and they've experienced that a few times, it's easier to to catch it. But I think it's, um, you know, you might find a lot of people, like I said, early in their career tackling that and and that can be challenging. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I also, one thing to add there, like we talk a lot about compensation, right. And so I'm not, we'll talk a little bit about this later. Um, and I don't want to do a whole episode on this, but we don't always do well in the social enterprise ministry, nonprofit world. Like if, if we're doing socially good things, sometimes that means you don't get compensated as much. And, um, And that can lead to burnout too, because you're worried about a lot of other things in your life. Right. And so we're going to talk about how to avoid some of those, but I think that's a reason why sometimes this is more prevalent in the social enterprise or, uh, or nonprofit. I think one other thing, Ryan, is just, there's a deeper, maybe spiritual and emotional attachment. And so where if you're working, you know, at a, some store or something, then you'll say, okay, it's five o'clock. I can clock out and go home. Whereas if you're dealing with people or you feel this spiritual 
responsibility or weight, or there's an emotional aspect of it that you're so passionate about that you started this business in the first place, you're going to be prone to put in the extra time, even if you don't get paid for overtime. And I think that, you know, doing that occasionally is one thing, but it's those seasons where you have to do it day in and day out that can really lead to burnout in this sphere too. Uh, Well, and you're generally choosing to get into these kinds of things because you want to serve and, and care for people. Right. And so your heart is already burdened for something, um, certain people or something like that. And, and then you've essentially like got a, yeah, like you, you're getting into it for that reason. And then you're taking on that burden for that reason. And so, yeah, you, you don't go home and, and turn mm-hmm. it off. Um, <laughs> my, my wife, uh, Kira sent me an article of like, a couple of weeks ago, um, I just pulled it up. It's uh, if you're a highly sensitive person, um, you experience the world differently. Here's what it means. And it was like basically a difference between uh, sympathy and empathy and how like getting rid of those terms might be helpful and saying like someone's highly sensitive or like we say introvert or extrovert, or we say empathy or sympathy. Um, and some people like really experience uh, the emotions of the people around them, which would make them a re- really good person in social enterprise or, or ministry or somewhere where you're uh, wanting to serve others. But it also becomes a really painful thing because it, when you're that way, you can't help but take that onto yourself. So it, it wreaks havoc on your body and your mental ability, your mental stress and all those kinds of things. So yeah, that's a really good point um, to bring up. on. That okay. Trip. Well, I think that Obviously, for our audience, we probably don't even need to spend much more time spelling out the burnout because a lot of people have felt it in seasons. <laughs> and just to overstate the obvious, you know, totally. we're talking in the world of social enterprise, nonprofit ministry, but I think a lot of these would apply across the board. Um, so as we go through these, you can kind of keep totally. that in mind. So should we go ahead and? And I'm going to, yeah, and just to, to point to that, like I'm going to share a lot about my experience when I was at, at Red Bull. Um, And when I first experienced burnout in that, in that season, um, and that was, that had nothing to do with ministry or not the nonprofit or serving, I mean, serving others. Yes, but it was just a different, different time. So, uh, yeah, my hope is that this is an episode that's helpful to people across the board, whether they're at a for-profit or nonprofit or everything in between. And, uh, we just know that it might be a little more, um, relevant to those in the, uh, doing some form of ministry or serving others. Yeah, yeah, let's go ahead and just jump in. Number one we have is to set boundaries. Um, And I was joking with a friend over this weekend about the book boundaries, but I think we talk a lot about boundaries without actually putting it into practice. And so the first way to avoid avoid Mm -hmm. burnout is to set boundaries. So Ryan, what do you think that looks like? Yeah, man, it, I, I've never been great at this one. Um, and Kira is my wife is really good at this one. Uh, probably we're both too far on the opposite ends of the spectrum and have to come together, but really it's, it's understanding. And we're going to talk about a lot of ways that this like plays out, but just understanding, like, how do you, like, we as humans are not as disciplined as we would, you know, like to say that we are. And so I, I like to say that having guardrails is, is really helpful. And you have kind of guardrails that are on the way outside and kind of in the middle. And so those, those might be guardrails of just like, Hey, I, I'm only going to work like over a month long period. I want to average this many hours of, of work a week. Right. That's not necessarily like tracking your time and being all stressed out about that. Cause I don't think it's helpful, but it's just kind of saying, Hey, on average, am I, am I in in these guardrails here, or, Hey, I am only going, I mean, we experienced this last, uh, last, um, spring and over the summer, Erica, where we had a bunch of international clients and I was getting up what four days a week at like six or six 30 to meet with an international client. But then we had a lot of other projects that were, um, on Pacific time or mountain time or a one in, in Europe. And so then I would have meetings to like, five or six because that worked for their time zone. And then I just started sandwiching in between. So I was literally just doing these 12 hour days. And over time, I just was like, man, this is not healthy. Um, but we still want to do that. So I think you and I, or however we did it, we like came up with this rule, like, Hey, we're only going to do like a, a meeting before like seven 30 or 8 AM, like twice a week or something like that. And that's been a great boundary for me just to say, Hey, that's a guardrail boundary on my calendar that doesn't, and honestly, like it's been, <laughs> it's been like very, very good. Now that there's going to be seasons where that has to change. Like if we, 
you know, if we got 10 projects in Asia or something, maybe I'd have to do that, but mm-hmm. kind of learn from that. So I take that as a good example. And yeah, thinking about them as right. guardrails. And I think that there are practical ways once you know yourself, if you know that, Hey, I'm an extrovert, I can do back to back to back meetings, then go ahead and schedule that. But if you know, you're not, then you need to be able to control your calendar and mm-hmm. say, Hey, I'm really good with people in the morning, but then after two or three meetings face-to-face or Zoom meetings with people, I need to work on an Excel spreadsheet or something else to use a different side of my brain for a while. And so I think feeling the freedom to set that, I think another practical one for me has been what I allow on my phone in terms of work emails and stuff. And there was a season in my life where I purposefully did not have internet at home. This was back in the early days of the internet, but I purposefully didn't get it at home because I knew that I would be tempted to overwork. And so it is a good boundary for Mm. me that I physically had to go into the office to work and use internet. And then when I was home, I was totally off. Um, So I think there are a lot of practical ways that you can flesh that out. Well, it's going to be different for everybody too. Cause as you were saying that uh, for me, having my email on my phone and all that, I don't have like notifications going off on my email, but I check it pretty consistently. Like, and that actually, I, I don't need a boundary on that personally because it, mm-hmm. it, it helps me. So as opposed to logging in, if I were to just like not check my email for eight hours or whatever, uh, and then log into my computer and go to tackle it like that would stress me out so much whereas i'm someone who more like i'd rather see those things coming in and just kind of be able to like process it and think about it when i want to and then be able to tackle it however that works so i guess what i'm saying there is hear all the things we're saying and then figure out hey what is that how does that work for you because those boundaries are gonna be different because we're all different created humans and learning mm-hmm. how to do that is really totally. important Awesome. Okay. Let's keep going. Number two, we says, we said, have friends outside of the sphere that you're working in and whether that's outside of your business or outside of your church or your nonprofit, this is a huge one um, that kind of ties into some of our later ones with hobbies and things, but just having friends outside of your day-to-day life is something we take for granted, I think. Yeah, totally. Yeah, oh, man, I'm going to go back to Red Bull a lot. So for those of you that don't know, I spent the first kind of, I don't know if the first part of my career, but I spent a few years in my 20s uh, at Red Bull and I was doing like 85 flights a year and 130 Marriott nights. And um, it was amazing. It was kind of like getting an MBA and it was also working really hard. And Red Bull is an amazing company that did, did the work-life balance thing pretty well in some ways and um, not in others. And it was also corporate and all that. But Um, I used to kind of call it the world of Red Bull. Like I could literally work and have all my friendships and everything in Mm -hmm. within Red Bull. And it was like, I was in it and I was drinking the Kool-Aid or however you want to say it. But like the rest, I could function totally fine in that and go for drinks and hang out and play sports and work out with that like world, Mm -hmm. especially when I was traveling. Um, and, and not have any relationships outside of it. Like it's actually pretty easy to do that. Um, like you said, it, 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 I think sometimes it's just how it dominates conversation. You know, if you're, uh, if every time you get together with people and they're all in, like, let's take a for-profit example. Like if you're a financial advisor and all your friends and all the people you hang out with their financial advisors and you do a barbecue on the weekend, and then the conversation naturally just drifts to that, like you're never getting right. a break from it, you know? Um, then you're never getting a perspective that's different from yours to kind of pull yourself out. And now I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I think it's good to have a barbecue with those people and to do that, but it's also so refreshing to just like hang out or be around people who like, honestly, sometimes don't even care about what you're doing. Um, you know, uh, so I, I don't know that those are some thoughts from my end and, and, but I think it's really important. I totally agree. I think that especially kind of in the ministry world, you know, when I was on staff at a church, I was, working at the church and then in a small group with people from the church and then going to church on Sundays. And so I was constantly around those people, which is great to be able to do life with people like that. And some of those people are still my dearest friends to this day, but at the same time, like you do need that outside perspective and you know, other people, some people are better than others at setting the conversational boundaries, because there were some of us that kind of knew like, Hey, when we're in small group, we're not necessarily talking about work stuff until, you know, if it's a big crisis, but it's hard to 
make sure everyone's on the same page as that. And so, like you said, having people where you can just talk about the NBA or talk about March Madness or talk about the weather um, and, you know, have those outside conversations is really helpful. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And, and being disciplined with it too, in the sense of like, sometimes I just, I, I like, I have to force myself not to talk about it. Cause if you're passionate about something, you want to talk about it with people, you know, and to have the discipline to say, you know what, I, I don't, I'm going to intentionally not, an- someone's going to ask me, Hey, h- how are you doing? Well, I could answer that question. Be like, Hey, work's been really cool. You know, we have this project here and there or whatever. Right. And, and that's not a bad answer, but sometimes to answer that way, just brings it right back to that. Right. And so, um, sometimes it's better to be like, man, it's good. Like family's been fun. We just like mountain biked or something, you know, and to kind of do that. So again, having a little discipline towards these things can, can be helpful, but mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. It's, it's an interesting one for sure. Uh, yeah. I guess a diversified friend group, you know, it, it helps you think differently too. Like you don't want to just be mm-hmm. around people who think the way you do all the time. You want to be around people who don't think the way you do, because that's going to challenge you to grow or push you in different directions. And that's a good thing. Exactly. And you realize that there's a lot going on outside of your own bubble in your business or nonprofit. Too, yeah. So. Oh man. That word bubble, like, let's just take that as the answer. Like when I was at Marquette, there was, we were in Milwaukee, like it's downtown and you know, it's a pretty affluent, not all, not all of it. Well, most of it, it's a private Jesuit Catholic college, right? So it's a fairly affluent, a lot of individuals from like the suburbs of certain cities and, and pretty wealthy. And so, but a lot of kids just like flew in like took a, we didn't have Uber then. So took a taxi or whatever, a shuttle to Marquette's campus. And it's a, it's a great campus and everything you had, you're right down to Milwaukee. They didn't have a car. And so we used to call it the Marquette bubble. And Mm -hmm. you literally could not leave this like 20 by 10 block radius for Mm -hmm. two or three months and be fine. And for me, I was like, man, so I, I had a car on campus. I was really thankful for that. It was really expensive to park it, but I was able to like, go to the mall or go to a movie or go play Frisbee somewhere to go do that stuff. And I couldn't believe the difference it was of like, yeah, the, I put it in air quotes, like the bubble. So if you're in a, in a, if you feel like you're in a bubble, that's maybe like a good indicator that this might be an issue for you. Right. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to keep moving on. Um, Number three is to keep learning and growing. And when we're talking here, we're talking about, yes, keep learning and growing, whatever your industry is, you know, that we always need to be learning and growing. But learn and grow outside of that also. Um, Ryan, I know that you love fantasy basketball um, and we both kind of have our ways to, to kind of escape and keep learning and growing. Um, but I think for me, you know, when I was in seminary, I joked that I, I rewarded myself with mountaineering biographies um, because <laughs> yeah. that was kind of my, like my escape and my hobby kind of thing where mm-hmm. I could just be learning about all these random adventures that happened all over the world in different times. And that for me just kept my brain growing and from growing stale too, after reading so many seminary books. Yeah. I love that example. Um, (laughs) Especially mountaineering too. Um, It's super cool. Yeah. I I'm totally with you on that front. Um, And it's funny, it's figuring out like what isn't stressful for you. I have probably read the first 40 or 50 pages of more books than anybody else has read books. Um, And it took me until maybe this last year and a half where I was like, I don't like reading. Like I, (laughs) I enjoy it, but I'm not the personality type that just sits down and, um, and reads a book. And usually if I do, I start dozing off as I'm reading. So I'm someone who like an audio book or a podcast conversation or things like that. That's, Mm -hmm. that's how I learn well. And so the reason I share that is like, one, as you think about keep learning and growing, like don't put yourself into a box of like how that should be. Like I I have a really hard time. Like a lot of the people I really respect knowledge, they're always talking about the books they've read and, and this one and that one. And so I'm like, oh man, I need to read more. Like I always think this, like I need to read more. I should read that book. Like I'm slacking that area. And then finally I was like, I'm just not going to force myself to do something that doesn't fit me. Like I'll learn different ways. Um, Mm -hmm. so I think that's really important. Um, and then, yeah, I think it's like you said, not just in your industry, like you mentioned fantasy bat, like I love the NBA and, um, I've recently, you know, been like, we're training, Kira's training for a marathon and, um, and I'm running with her cause I'm, I'm going to run it also. Um, 
but she doesn't like to talk when we're running. <laughs> She's like, Hey, I just want you to be there for moral support, but don't, don't talk to me as much as possible because I, she wants to <laughs> do it. So I put a podcast on and as I'm opening my podcast, I've got my uh, Spotify, I've got all these podcasts, but like social enterprise or entrepreneurship or investing or faith driven investing or venture capital or uh, sermons or, or um, theology, all these different things. And very often I feel this like tension of, okay, well, that's a great way to grow, but it's so tied to feast over famine and what we do that. Like if I, my tendency is like, oh, I probably should just grow and learn there because I have a responsibility to our clients and the people we serve and all that kind of stuff. Um, but you can really burn yourself out on that. Cause then in those restful times, like even when you get a chance to grow and learn, you're not, you're stretching yourself in the same ways. So it's much like having the same friend group. So for me, I've been listening to this like fantasy basketball podcast when we've been running and it's, it's the, the reason that's been fun for me. The realization was like, it, it's, uh, I'm very strategic. I love, st uh, statistics. I love, you know, st like strategy stats, all that kind of stuff. And they go into all that stuff. So it's using my like skill sets it's not like mindlessly listening to something. It's using those skill sets of mine, <clears throat> but it's in something completely different that I can't even like tie back to the, the business thing as possible. So yeah, that's just an example for me personally lately of, of what that's been looking like. And I, I do think that's really important. And, you know, I'm just now learning that. And so, you know, who knows how that will change things over time. Right. And I think the other thing about keeping um, that mentality of learning is, that you have to have a little bit of humility in order to be a learner. And I think that um, this could be a whole nother podcast, but I think that pride can lead to burnout because if you're always the answer man, if you're always the, pe the person people go to when they have questions, then there's that pressure on you. Whereas if you're putting yourself mm. in the place of the learner, you have to assume a different posture and it kind of just even relaxes you, you know, and I always respect adults who start a new hobby or like take singing lessons or take piano lessons and start when they're adults, because a lot of us don't like to be in that place where we don't know what's going on and we're learning from yeah. the very beginning, you know? So I think that it just changes your posture when you say, Hey, I'm going to always be learning and growing in this area. It takes a lot of humility. You're right. Um, yeah, that's really cool. That's a good point. Um, that's a really important point. I like that one. Yeah. All right, everyone, I want to take a quick break from today's episode and just share a little bit about Impact Foundation, who's got an incredibly awesome model of using impact investment, charitable dollars, and funding tons of projects all over the world right now. But what if your investments could change the world? At Impact Foundation, they believe business with purpose has the power to transform society. Purpose built for impact investing, Impact Foundation provides a streamlined way to fund businesses that seek social and spiritual transformation or make loans to charity, all while earning a financial return to grow your giving. Donors and investors have already supported more than 200 redemptive enterprises through their impact accounts. They provide needed fuel for companies that exist as a force of God's redemptive work in the world. To learn more about what they're doing in their kingdom impact investing model, visit impactfoundation.org. Okay, moving on to number four. Um, this is something, Ryan, I know we're both living this out in our own lives, but you've got to, in order to avoid burnout, you've got to balance it with the season of your personal life um, and just be aware of that and know the season you're in and acknowledge that, especially if you are um, raising a family. Um, you know, for us having a new baby, obviously life and sleep and everything has looked different for the last few months than it did before that. Um, and so just knowing those seasons can help you balance to say, hey, maybe it's not the best idea to launch this new product line you know, a month after having a baby or something like that. Um, and I don't know, Ryan, I know you've talked through different seasons with different people. Um, and maybe you have some more examples of what that kind of can look like for someone for the good or the bad. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's a, it's an interesting one. Um, but yeah, I think it, it goes back to those guard, like balancing with your personal life. Just, you can't, it goes back to those guardrails. Like if you're just grinding, 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 all the time, you're going to break. Right. And so I just think we're created as humans in a way that we're supposed to be diversified with what we do. Um, mm -hmm. I also think, you know, 
we have a lot of listeners who are Christians and a lot who aren't, but from a biblical standpoint, um, and if you're not a Christian, like you can find value in this still Mm -hmm. from biblical standpoint, it's like God, spouse, kids, like work, you know, that's, that's kind of the order. Right. And I'm not going to get all theological on all that stuff, but the point being like, we are created to have an order there and that is intention. And so I, I, you know, we're going to talk more in depth about seasons and a couple bullet points here. Um, but I think as far as balancing the personal life, it just, we're just called to do that. Right. Um, and I think, it's so hard to shift it though, because sometimes serving your family and your, your spouse and your kids is to provide for them financially. And so to get that mixed up in your head is, is so tough. And it's one I struggle with all the time. It's like, okay, well, you know, um, balancing with my personal life, being a good dad would be taking Caden on a, a hike later. Uh, but mm-hmm. unfortunately I'm going to have to like have him watch a movie while I get some work done because I do have to provide now if I'm doing that every single day, or maybe every that maybe the parenting situation you're in is every day you have to do that. But if I don't have to do that every day, or um, it's becoming like a bad habit in that sense, you have to watch out for it. You know? So again, this isn't a black and white thing. There's a lot of people out there that are single parents that are like, yeah, my kid watches two movies a day so that I can like get by. That's awesome. Right. And that's great. You know? And, and that's different than me saying, man, you know, I'm watching Caden while Kira has an appointment and I probably could just take that hour and not work and just be with him or something, you know? So it's just pressing into like what that looks like for you. Um, And we're going to talk about, I think this, this bullet point expands some of the next, (laughs) next items on the list. So I'll hold off on those, but I just think it's like figuring out like what that looks like. I also want, oh, go ahead. Okay. I think that this one is more just knowing the seasons of your family. Cause we're going to talk about seasons of work, but I think knowing the seasons of your family, that if you've got a, you know, an ailing parent, or if you've got kids graduating from high school, or just knowing that season of your family allows you to set those boundaries in a realistic way that we talked about earlier. And I'm just going to throw this in there as someone who, um, worked in ministry in the nonprofit world as a single person for a long time. I think that's something where we need to have healthy um, understandings of seasons of life and boundaries for everyone. Cause there was a lot of times where some people with families would say, Oh, well, I've got to go be with family. You can finish this up. And it's like, wait, wait, you can't just dump everything on a single person because they're in a different season of life. And so I think that we all have to be aware of the season of life that we're in, in our personal lives in order to better handle our quote unquote work and ministry life. Yeah. No, love that. And totally agree with you. Um, number five that we have on here, I love, um, but a great way to avoid burnout is to start building your team early. Um, and even if it's not the ideal team where everyone's, you know, a hundred percent in their right capacity field, the more people you get around you right away allows for more accountability and multiplication and health and being able to take breaks later on. And so I think that there's a lot of people in the social enterprise world that wish they would have had more people around them earlier, um, even if they were still kind of trying to figure that out. And so I think that this can be huge to help people avoid burnout. Yeah. And it's a tough, it's a double-edged sword for a lot of people because a lot of people are like, look, I can barely provide for myself in the early seasons of an, or even just like any season of organization, you know, corporations do this. They burn out team members because they're, you know, they're trying to save budget. So there's always like a financial component to this. And that's why I say it's a double-edged sword. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to make less money because I'm paying a team member, but is that healthy? You know? And so it was a few years into our business that I, um, feast over famine before I hired like an admin operations director. And then obviously you came along Erica on that. Um, and that was a game changing. So I think it's, you know, listening to, what's kind of happening in doing that. But it, the, I guess the point I'm trying to make is there's a financial investment that you have to make. And it's, it's taking a risk on yourself. It's saying, I believe that this thing is going to work. I believe that I have the skill to make it work, all those kinds of things. And I need a team around me. And for a season, like you're just going to plateau on profitability or whatever for that. Um, mm-hmm. If you're in the nonprofit space and you don't, you're not thinking of it that way. Um, 
you should be, but it, it, it's not about profit in that sense, um, in terms of how the financials work, then it might be increasing your fundraising goals. And we talked to a lot of organizations about this, of like, hey, you guys are like going to burn out any day now. And well, it, either there have been organizations that I have told to dial back their program so that they can get a healthier balance of team members. So it might be that they, you know, raise a million dollars a year of fundraising and they spend 750k on program and 250k on on everything else and that everything else really they're burning out their team it should probably be 400k back up and make it 400k hire the right team members and dial back your program that is such a hard decision to make because you're not going to serve as many people um Mm -hmm. but you're going to be able to serve those 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 leftover people for a longer period of time as a result of it um and so this is a, you have to make that investment in yourself. It's going to be, there's going to be a financial component, but it's also like one of the best things that you can do is to protect that. And, and I don't like, I don't love this, this answer that I'm going to give, but I think it's helpful sometimes is like, figure out what your time is worth, you know? And it's not to say that who you're hiring to do those things is worth less of time, but if you're billing, you know, if, if you're some sort of consultant or something and you're billing, you know, $80 an hour and for your client work, but the administrative side of your business is taking, you know, 20 hours a week. Like, could you Mm -hmm. hire that out? Like with a virtual assistant, have them do the admin side. Now you can build the clients more. So just kind of start to think about, okay, what is my time worth with my ex- experience, expertise, and at the season of the career, my career that I'm in. And that's going to change in all sorts of seasons and um, different things. And use that as kind of an ROI barometer of if that's worth it or not. Yeah. And I think too, there's the other piece of it that to bring other people on is obviously not only going to possibly slow down the profit profitability, but also per, slow down the productivity because you're going to have to take time to train someone or cast vision. And, you know, a lot of times we don't delegate because it's just quicker and easier to do things ourselves. But like you said, over time, that's going to produce more lasting fruit and, you know, maybe some deeper results than just kind of getting through it. Um, and I also think that in adding someone early to the team, um, it really just helps to fuel that vision too. And it kind of reminds you on those hard days early on that, Hey, we're in this together and we're in it for the long haul to kind of get this thing done. And so it multiplies you in that way, because it just gives you that energy. Whereas if you're alone, you know, in the trenches, just slogging it day after day, it can be really hard and lonely in there. And so there's that other yeah. unspoken motivation that comes with it too. Totally. And I, I see that in, in seasons of our organization, like even bringing you on Erica, I, I don't know how many times there's just been, well, last week was one of them. We were going to record this podcast and we spent like 45 minutes or an hour just catching right. up on stuff and, and kind of brainstorming and talking about this client project or that one, or what you guys are doing. And and it was like really motivating for me because I've been, I was in my head for like a couple of months and we hadn't had one of those conversations. So I think having a team, it just, right. it's just kind of nice sometimes. Yeah. And I think one of the cool things that we've seen with projects lately is I can think of a couple, couple projects this year where sitting down and doing the strategic planning and looking at their financial um, goals for the next five years helps them to see that, okay, in order to be healthy in five years as an executive or a d- executive director or whatever, um, I've got to actually invest in team members before I invest in some of the services. And so I think that that's where we have come alongside. And honestly, I think that we've prevented a couple of people from burnout by saying, Hey, you need to add a team member and figure out the cost of that before you start to expand your business a lot more. And so I think that there's something to be said to just count the cost and look all the way around at that to make sure you have the resources to make it happen at the right time. Totally. Yeah, totally. Well, 100% on board with all of that. Yeah. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening to another week of the Feast Over Famine podcast. We are so thankful you guys are here and listening. As always, hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast listening apps. Uh, We would love to keep you guys up to date on new episodes that are coming out when we're launching new episodes and we're launching new seasons uh, and everything in between. 
So uh, when we're in season, episodes are dropping every single Wednesday. Hit that subscribe button. Make sure you're up to date. Also, uh, if you're loving what we're doing, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, where we're constantly posting about our projects, what they're doing, uh, what kinds of things we're working on. We'll recycle some uh, podcasts, uh, things about our partners, all sorts of fun stuff that you want to see. So hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, all that kind of stuff and check out what we're doing there. And yeah, we're stoked that you guys are listening. We hope this has been really fruitful and we will catch you guys next week. And lastly, uh, as you guys all know, we always talk about all sorts of things with impact investing, uh, investment opportunities, entity structure modeling, how projects are getting capital. And as a disclaimer and a reminder, Feast Over Famine does not provide legal tax accounting or other professional advice. You should consult professional advisors concerning the legal tax or accounting consequences of any activities related to your project or a project you're supporting. Feast Over Famine doesn't consult, advise, or assist with the offer or sale of securities in any capital raising transaction. We don't do that for the direct or indirect promotion or maintenance of a market for any securities. Uh, and Feast Over Famine does not engage in any activities for which an investment advisor's registration or license is required under the U.S. Investment Advisors Act of 1940 or under any other applicable federal or federal, federal or state law or for which a broker's or dealer's registration or license is required under the U.S. Securities Exchange Act of 1934 or under any other applicable federal or state law. So there's your investment disclaimer. Uh, hopefully that's helpful if you need it. And if you ever have any questions on that side of things, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Take care.